This episode of the Boss Horse Podcast is brought to you by, well, you. If you want to learn how to support our family of podcasts, head over to patreon.com slash boss media or search for us on the Patreon app on your smart device. Thanks for helping us build something better. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Boss Rush Podcast, a great place to play games and be better. I'm one of your hosts, Corey Deering, and alongside me, as always, is the PC Muscle Race himself, slumming it with a regular bottle of water, LaRon mm-hmm. Dawkins. Mm-hmm. What's poppin', everyone? Mm. Oh, that's a fancy bottle, though. Mm. Mm. It's, it's a smart water with the alkaline 9 plus mm. pH. Mm-hmm. Yeah, alkaline water. Mm. Speaking of all that sciencey stuff, the mad pharmacist herself, Stephanie Klimov, is here. Yes, I'm in the middle of buy- pre-ordering the new Link Amiibo. Please do not disturb me. <laughs> do not disturb. I kind of want I... that Amiibo myself. I, I don't really collect Amiibos like that, and I kind of want it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I, uh... Yeah, I'll probably get it, just because I have the other ones. But, guys, we have a special guest tonight. Very, very special guest. He is... An award-winning composer and technical audio designer. If you are listening on free feeds, you're going to probably get a double dose of him this week uh, because Celeste also did a 1v1 that you can check out very, very soon. Chase Bathia is here. Hello. Hello. Hello, Chase. How's it going, everyone? Um, Welcome. Welcome to the show. Yeah, welcome. It's great. Thank you. I'm I'm glad you're here. Uh, So before we kind of get into a lot of things tell people who you are and and what you really do and like what games you've worked on because it's exciting yeah so i'm chase bathia i'm a professional video game composer and technical audio designer what this typically means is that i specialize in writing dynamic and interactive music that align to player mechanics and i usually come up with these ideas myself through a lot of research that i've done because i've been working in the industry for about 12 years and i've shipped about 21 games at a time hopefully by this year i would have shipped five more but we'll see game development is very hard but we're gonna we're gonna pull it off (laughs) that's awesome I really enjoy it's part of my passion it's what I it's what I love to do day in and day out and it's a it's very hard work it's very mentally draining in a good way because after you get through the journey there's always a good story and a postmortem to tell so I am very excited to touch the people's ears provide them the ear candy and provide great sonic identity to the projects that I'm able to score See, that's one of those things where I feel like the general public would be like, oh, man, what a you know cakewalk of a job. That must be so awesome and easy. The awesome part might be true, but like a lot of hard work and time must go into it. And so I, I have a lot of respect for that. And uh, at least from the beginning, I feel like any sort of sound, whether it's just like virtual soundtrack or just sounds like as you're going through the game – really help make or break a lot of my experiences in games um and absolutely don't want to necessarily jump the topic i know it's not like exactly the same but for example when the grammys finally created its own category for video uh, video game or interactive media score like finally just getting some recognition in the space so yeah I'm stoked absolutely and i'm very excited for that category for many reasons <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, so that's that's cool. So when you mean when you mean dynamic, so you're you mean like say, we'll use Zelda as an example. It's not like we're going to talk enough about that today. Hey, perfect uh, example. I got I, I got you. We could do this. <laughs> so, uh, so like when you're just like kind of roaming through, uh, high roll field, kind of chopping down grass and picking up apples and cooking food, and then you kind of walk into an encounter. Is that kind of what you do? Where like that music changes into that kind of combat heavy kind of thing yeah exactly so breath of the wild would be a perfect example to go off of i was just doing a musical analysis of this with some type of introspective deep dive and before i was really in that lane my ears were catching on to number one feeling like Breath of the Wild might be the first game that presents itself musically as a piano concerto, as that's the entire sound world that you typically would hear. And obviously through different cutscenes, you'll hear different layers and orchestra things. But specifically for the combat, Corey, that you mentioned is that 
that there's a there's a specific intro that happens and it has a percussive type of rhythm and then there's more layers that come in and then there is a other layer that comes in for the all the instruments together it's called a tootie now one thing that a lot of people miss that i actually caught is that there's little motifs when you hit the actual character it goes dunna, dunna, and it goes dunna. if if you're playing you're usually too much into the combat to notice but i picked up on it and it's very so subtle and those are the dynamic nuances that really tie and give this cohesiveness together for the entire game that i love so actually actually nice I know what you're talking about because I, even though I haven't played uh, Breath of the Wild myself, I've seen I've seen a few people play it. Like I've been sitting on the couch with them as they play it. And I've noticed those those musical tones that you're talking about in combat and stuff like that. And I'm like, and it's one of those magical things that Nintendo kind of does. They pay attention to detail on certain on certain franchises, and, and Zelda typically is one of those. Yes. Um, and and it just and it kind of reminded me of like back in the days when like I was playing like the old school Link to the Past, and like how they, I felt like Link to the Past was like the first nintendo first party game that was just so musically driven like you know like you you could tell they were flexing their the best with the with the hardware at the time you know to 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 push sound you know just as well as they yeah. push you know uh gameplay and stuff like that so yeah, yeah. but i didn't notice what you were talking about in breath of the wild <laughs> nice yeah not too many pick up people pick up on that so good ears I yeah. I love I love I, I love video game music back when it was just nothing but chip tune and stuff like that. I love video game music. So as as things have as as music and composition and and sound design has evolved in in video games over the past past forty for forty some odd years, that I've been a gamer and stuff like that. You know, like I've I've always just like like tuned into it. So yeah, I'm I'm glad I'm glad somebody like you are, are here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad to be here. Thank you again. Yeah, so Zelda, like even the music stuff in Zelda, because like the the overworld music is kind of just kind of ambient in that game where like it just, you know, I mean, it's not like it's not like Ocarina of Time or, or Twilight Princess where you're running through the Zelda. The Zelda theme is like blaring, right? And, and Breath of the Wild, it's just kind of ambient. And then depending where you are, like it kind of gets louder or has different tones to it. And it. I just I think it's cool that like you're the person that does that for games. That's just I don't know. It's just it's cool. I'm, this is awesome. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so uh, what game what games have you worked on? I saw uh, a ground. Is that what it's called? A ground? A ground? Yeah. Some people say a ground. Some people say a ground. I say a ground. Tomato, tomato. <laughs> so <laughs> I've worked on a ground. I, I, that's the one I've won an award for best soundtrack for. And then I was nominated in the industry in 2016 for my score for I Can Escape Darkness, which was the sequel to I Can Escape. And then my soundtrack for Cubic Climber was in Destructoid for Noteworthy back in 2013, I believe. It's in Deity Quest and Reclaim Earth, Quest Light Pocket, and I'm trying to go the Super Happy Fun Block. And a couple other more. I've done about Electron Flux, 13 different soundtracks. I've shipped games, but I usually was doing sound design, but I'm no longer a sound designer. I'm just specifying composition and interactive technical audio design. So with all the 13 soundtracks, those are the games that mostly like shipped that are of notoriety that I've done the music composition for that have releases in that respect. Cool. So Chase, like we said, obviously we're really happy you're here. Our audience is is happy you're here too we have a couple questions before we actually t jump into what we've been playing oh nice so uh our first question comes from uh still saying shane from our discord uh shane kelly uh he says uh hello chase what are your favorite instruments to both create your own music and instruments and in, in others in others music what are your favorite games and game soundtracks Ah, so three part. So we got favorite instruments, favorite games, and favorite game soundtracks, right? Yeah. Cool. So I so as I've been doing a little bit more videos on my YouTube channel showcasing like behind the scenes of how I create some of the music I do for games and the process that goes into it, because I was doing this typically on my Twitch channel as well. I've now believe to myself that I'm become a multi-instrumentalist. So for example, 
I'm scoring a puzzle game that's in Steam Neck Fest right now called On the Peril of Parrots, and I'm playing mandolin. I just recorded the penny whistle today. Uh, and then I'm recording a instrument for it's like shakers. They're, they look like this. <laughs> it's kind of cool. And playing djembe. And I am, well, it's not, I played also saxophone, which is my first instrument. Nice. Piano is my second instrument, which I've studied classical and jazz on. And so, yeah, a couple <laughs> others, pan flute and many more. I really just trying to feel the texture for the music that I'm doing and I'm having fun while doing it. It's really just tapping into my childhood as if I was going to be, I want to be playing that and I want to play this and I want to play that, but I at least now know the professionalism steps of it. And so I know I need to practice at least 30 minutes to an hour before as a warm up, then come up with something that fits the piece that I'm already starting and then recording it and then mixing it and making it happen and putting it into the game to make sure that it all fits and it sounds good and that the developer likes it too so those are all the many instruments that i'm typically playing on any soundtrack just depends really it just depends on what game it is favorite games there are so many that i usually like to mention which is Turok battle of the dinosaurs on game boy and batman forever on Shadow of Mordor, uh, on PS4, and I like Gun Gage. I like some import games. My my range is all over the place. It's not the typical games that people typically would normally have access to or play because I've had a very interesting like range of game libraries to have. I actually own 800 physical copy games. I'm a retro game collector. Nice. So when nice. We have to play when i'm talking about games i'm thinking off the top of my my mind it's it there, there's some i've always mentioned right off the bat and then there's not of course beyond oasis the oh my gosh the answer oh yeah. man oh my yeah, deep oh beyond my the, god yeah, i got a response for you i'm like yes oh, so man. beyond oasis is my was actually on my top favorite because it it's just amazing 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 i can speed run it in eight hours it's not it's actually not that fast some people did it in an hour which is pretty great but yuzo koshiro who a lot of people know did the music for streets of rage did also that soundtrack too and uh -huh. i did an analysis of it and when that article came out he actually followed me on twitter so that's like a badge of honor oh that oh i man. have to have oh the my god koshiro san follow me on twitter through that article of an analysis from beyond oasis that i played as a child so for many reasons, as it was an answer to a link to the past on Super Nintendo, I believe that was the first largest adventure game that was on Sega Genesis. So I'd love to go on, but that ties into the soundtracks <laughs> as well. Beyond Oasis being one of them. Echo, Defender of the Future, being on Dreamcast, was composed by Tim Folan. Again, Turok Battle of the Dinosaurs, Alberto, Jose Gonzalez, masterful composer for the chiptune 8-bit era. And... Castlevania Lords of Shadow, I have to say, is one of those soundtracks as well by Oscar Arujo. In one of the compo not usually Michiro Yamane, who did Symphony of the Night, another one of my favorite games, another great soundtrack. But Oscar Arujo really just brought this cinematic, heartfelt, emotional story with not really scoring too many games, if any at all, before then, and just really just touched it and landed it really well with that series. That's awesome. I so, yeah. <laughs> Ever, Ever Oasis, man. Like, so that was one of the few. Like, I was a I was a Genesis kid growing up. I never had a Super Nintendo, so Ever Oasis was like, you know, I I had Link's Awakening for Game Boy, and that was kind of like my first introduction to Zelda. But like, yes, me Ever too. Oasis was kind of like really the first introduction to Zelda. I mean, it's not even really a Zelda game, but that was like what they were going for, right? And Man, Ed and I did a whole Sega Genesis episode for Expansion Pass about six months ago, and I think we talked about Ever Oasis for like 25 minutes out of the, the hour. Because Wait, is Ever Oasis the Japanese name for it? Or not Over Oasis. Uh, yeah, no? Beyond Oasis. Beyond, Beyond Oasis. Oasis. Oh. Okay, okay. Right. I just I just, I just had to make wow. sure because I... Sorry. I, 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 I figured that was the... I figured you were talking about Beyond Oasis, we, but I just had to be th sure. We did a 3DS episode recently, and Ever Oasis is on my mind, so... I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Beyond Oasis, okay. we were talking about. And man, we probably talked about it for like a half hour. 
Um, <laughs> easily like, right easily, it's, yeah. so, it's, it's such a great game yeah, yeah. beyond a, oasis that that was the game i retired my sega genesis with that was the last game i bought and that was the last game i beat man. wow that's yeah did the 100 levels too oh my god <laughs> <laughs> i did because i was that type of gamer back then i i did oh, like i you had to my my gaming my gaming battery is not like that now like i like like right now i'm currently playing uh we will talk about it in, in a little bit i'm but i'm currently playing a game and i'm sitting here like do i want to like 100 this because like i used to 100 this game back when back before it was remastered and i'm like do i want to 100 this or do i just want to play it have my fun and move on <laughs> yeah yeah i definitely i understand that rygar on ps2 another great game did that hunter level thing oh too. ps2 yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and i was thinking oh, this, this is a little this is a little <laughs> A little crazy yeah <laughs> yeah um all right so our next question comes from josh martinez he actually has two questions for you he says what is your pro- process for crafting a game soundtrack uh what do you take into account uh when making a track for any given portion level of a game and uh what was the game slash moment that inspired you to pursue composing in a game in gaming so the process that i usually take is i'm trying to i'm trying to determine what the game is telling me if there's like a build or if there if it's a game design document when it's on words it's, it's i usually try to use my imagination as best as i can and then then the next step is to typically look at the art or concept art or reference art of some sort and tie it into whatever the game design document it has now I'm pretty fortunate to just mostly have builds. The programmers and designers are typically pretty fast to kind of get something like some kind of vertical slice or prototype happening. And that is where the magic for me typically happens the quickest because then I'm able to hear what the sonic world is going to be in my mind before I even, I'm even writing any type of music or doing type of design. If I'm thinking about any type of dynamic design, I'm pretty much writing it out on index cards or pieces of paper and determining where not only what the story is but what are the mechanics that i feel are pretty cool because they're already implemented and i'm able to test that out and then from there i decide i I take my my retro experience of the sonic identity from the chipsets from the sega genesis the ym2612 to the super nintendo the sp700 and understanding that those have those identity for sounds and, and try to incorporate with that sonic identity for the game that i'm utilizing which comes into the instrumentation so i i, I pick certain sample libraries or i decide that i want to play certain live instruments or hire live musicians to kind of enhance the texture and the sonic world of what that game will be and then from there i um mostly crafting around what I feel the story is supposed to be told for maybe a level or an area or whatever the goal is in terms of like the mechanics and make sure first it's it's a heavy part of the game. It's 50% of the experience, but it also has to be subtle because it's a part of the entire art form and it collaborated. And that is the process that I typically take from that part the game that inspired me to start in game composition, it is like a two part. I would have to say it's being told that my music sounded like it should be in a video game in 2000, from 2002 to 2009 is been circulating in my mind. It just didn't, I couldn't make the crossover and I didn't know, but I, there's, it's like three things happen. I was working at an internet media company and someone had said that your music sounds like it belongs in Castle Crashers. And then I looked up Castle Crashers and then I realized that that the music I wrote for this thing that was on my job did sound like that. And then it was thinking, oh, it's not a (laughs) this is not a triple A game. This is like an indie game. How did that happen? So like the cog wheel started to turn. Then I found something called Mugen. And if you're familiar Mm. with Mugen, it oh, yeah. is it, perfect so those who are not familiar it's like this open source fighting game engine that you can put any character against another character death star versus homer simpson or something crazy or your favorite anime character jojo bizarre adventure versus 
light from death notes <laughs> or, or, yeah. or anything like the mix up. And so what I, I had started customizing the characters and then the background, but more importantly, I had implemented my own music into the game by just learning the, just how to do it on my own. And that was a click of, wait, wait a minute. This is really cool. My music is in this game right now. And I did it myself. And the third thing was, I remember watching a, I unlocked something in God of War three. It was a, orchestra session with a couple of the composers that worked on that game and in the interview one of now one of my friends Gerard Marino had mentioned that the music could be whatever you want it to be in the world there's no limitation for game music and it doesn't have it's not a specific area you can your creativity is abundant and that was just the light bulb that connected everything. And so I remember making a demo for Grand Treasure on PS1 and uploading it to my YouTube channel. It's still there to this day. I did like captures and put stuff. And when I start to see that when people say it sounds like it should be in a video game and I see it aligned to the game, I was thinking, oh, well, I've implemented the music. I've been told this is what it is. I've seen that. My creativity is all over the place for the sound. I think this is going to work. So it's kind of like a three-part thing that happened. That's very cool. <laughs> yeah, that's really cool. That's awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned it because I was going to ask how you like broke into the business, but you you practically mentioned it right there. <laughs> that's just that's the small iceberg of it. There's a second part to the the break in part, but yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Um, all right, well, uh, let's 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 switch gears here. Uh, if you want to hear more about Chase's career, there is a 1v1 coming up uh, in the next couple weeks for patrons and uh, free feeds alike. So you'll be able to hear a full hour and 10 minute interview with Celeste and Chase. So that that's that interview was awesome, by the way. Uh, Thank you. As the as the person who edited it and listened to it twice to make sure everything was great. It was a great interview. Uh, so can't wait for you guys to check that out. Where did Stephanie go? So, all right. So, should we should we do the thing? Uh, I still see her waveform, so I think. We're okay, right. say something real fast, Stephanie. She can't hear us. She can't hear us. All right, go ahead and stop the recording and uh, and reload. So, before we get into the Nintendo Direct uh, stuff. Anybody anybody playing anything cool? Chase, we're going to start with you. You are our esteemed guest tonight. So we'll start with you. And you have games on the dock that I want to hear about. Okay. Yeah. I'm playing Lock and Chase on Game Boy. I'm actually modded it. It's on my PSP, but I'm going to pick up the Game Boy cartridge. Up the, nice. Up the, up the street because I want to add to that. Have you any of you played that one before? Before I dive into it? Oh. No. no. Okay. Yeah. So... Game Boy being one of my earliest systems that I had owned as a child, this one passed my radar, and I kind of stumbled upon it. I clearly was, like I said, modeled it and put it on my PSP, but I, I like to play new type of games, and so I love puzzle games, and so the three big puzzle games are Quirk, Quart, and Kicks. But Lock and Chase was this little you're that character. You're basically a, a, a thief, and you got to run away from the police and you pick up little bags of money, but you're also trying to get like the little nodes. So it's like Pac-Man, but you, you're, you're just getting money and trying to stay away from the police. And eventually there's a big diamond that you want to kind of get, but, and it's no longer collecting nodes. You have to cl- push this key, not into warp points, but get it into a path where and you can get the big diamond the levels are very odd. I felt like I beat the game, the credits rolled, and then the game continued. So I then I got to this other part where I had to do it again, and this game is hard at this typical level. So that's one of the reasons why I want to go get the actual cartridge so that I can play it all the way through. It doesn't seem like it's a very long game to get by. And like maybe maybe a day's worth of playing. Maybe. I would even have to, I would be so fair to say like two to three hours if you're just focused and no interruptions. So that one's pretty cool. And then the other puzzle game that I was doing for now homework, when I got it, it wasn't that. But now there's, like I was saying, there's a game I'm scoring and I wanted to kind of pick up on 
the system types that they typically do is Luminous and Luminous Plus. And so Luminous, I actually have it right here on PSP. Uh, nice. This one is going to focus. Yeah, there we go. Yes. So there isn't, this one is phenomenal. The soundtrack is great. What this typically does is like a Tetris form. And what I learned is that the, the, the creative director who ended up making Tetris Effect made Luminous because he couldn't get the rights of Tetris when he wanted it. So he made Luminous and Luminous Plus. And so it's just like a normal Tetris games. You got to clear the lines, but it's tied to actual the music. So every time you're changing the nodes to the shapes to align to get your lines up, the music is either going to repeat in, in a static form. And then once you clear it, it's going to continue on until you get the entire track. And it's brilliant design, masterful, super fun. I can't say more great things about it, and that's what I'm playing right now. I, mean, and uh, I overheat. I overheated my PSP with the original Luminous game. Yeah, and... I know. I was going to say the same thing. I I think I own six games for my PSP. I own two the two God of War games. I owned Kingdom Hearts: Birth by Sleep, uh, ta- uh, Final Fantasy Tactics, and then Luminous. <laughs> it, Luminous hardly left my PSP because, like, yeah. I'm a huge Tetris fan, and Luminous is like you know on that same level and it's just oh man luminous so yeah. good yeah i love i love puzzle games and i love i love rhythm games and like it it's the perfect mix so it was like yeah like and, and it was like a launch game too that's the crazy mm-hmm. part it was one of the first games out for the launch of the psp and i was like you know oh wow like, uh, i'm i'm i was i was definitely a sony fanboy back in those days so um so i picked up i picked up psp and i was like there's no way there's no way i'm gonna have just one game so i like i, I picked up like four five games for for that first that first month and luminous was literally the, the first game <laughs> wow yeah man luminous awesome love it. it it seemed to have lost its magic over the over the over the decades though yeah, the the Switch version isn't as good as the PSP. It's just not as responsive. Well, now they have got Tetris Effect, and if the the creative director did make Tetris Effect as as he made Luminous, so you're kind of if you wanted to just hop over, it's still you you kind of probably have that same magic. But I think it's still good to go back to the the old school. Right? Yeah, it's, it feels good. <laughs> yeah, Tetris Effect though too. Oh, what a game. Uh. Stephanie, you're still playing The Last of Us. Are you? Question. Are you playing? Are you like? Pl- I know you're watching the show and you guys are doing your Last of Us review uh, show. Are you playing the game with the show or are you just kind of playing through the game and wherever you stop, you stop and then you talk about the show? I mean, I'm trying to play along with the show. Can you hear me? Okay, there you go. I didn't see my sound waves. I was playing along with the show, but I'm, I'm playing the game before I see the episode, so it's kind of hard to see where the episode is going to go. And not only that, but Hogwarts Legacy is coming out for me on Friday, so I'm having my my t- my window of game you know game time is shrinking. So I kind of like I I jumped way ahead to where you're at. You play as Ellie, and and Joel is sick, so I'm getting towards that part, even though we're you know. The, the TV series hasn't gone that far yet. So I'm kind of pushing it a little bit. I want to finish The Last of Us in another week or two um, and, and just be done with it. And and I, I hate saying that because I don't want to sound like it's a game that I don't care for. I'm absolutely loving the remake. Um, it, it is more challenging with enemy AI and it's just gorgeous. And I'm just really thoroughly enjoying the, the story, you know, going through the story again. I love the music. So, but uh, after the direct, there might be just some games I might be starting. Well, probably not tonight because I'll take some NyQuil after this and go to bed. But <laughs> um, my my list of things that I've, I'm playing will be changing soon. I know I've, it's only been The Last of Us for the last few weeks. That's fine. I, that's fine. All those Game Boy games and Game Boy Advance games. Uh, and Metroid Prime being Stop. released. Stop. Please today. move on. Please move on before I'm, I start talking about yeah, it. Yeah, I'm being, I'm being, I'm being very bad right now because um, I've been because uh, I did what Austin used to do and was only playing and was only playing one game at a time before I move on. And uh, and thanks to Nintendo Direct, uh, now like there's a game that's being played alongside Dead Space. <laughs> uh, is it another space shooty game? 
<laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> who would have thought? Oh man, Laron, what what are what are you? Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me hold on, Stephanie, real quick. You did uh, you didn't pre order um, you didn't pre order in advance for Hogwarts Legacy because I, I, uh, you. Uh, it's huh? only the deluxe edition. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't oh, it's only the deluxe edition. I didn't wait. Right. Like extra money as. As hardcore as you are about uh, worry about this game, I thought this would have been shooing for you for the deluxe edition. I overspent on video game and video game related <laughs> items last year, so this year, as part of my New Year's resolution, I need to be very conservative as to the type of editions that I buy, and not everything I buy oh, needs to be an edition. <laughs> Then also, that means no. Then that means no Tears of the Kingdom yes. edition. Anything for you? No. You buy the amiibo. You yes. buy the amiibo. Yes. The amiibo, and you move on. No. No. Unless no. it's around your birthday, then you get a little spin <laughs> to kind of go in between there. So hopefully no. something around there. Zelda. I have part of my wall dedicated to all Zelda. Okay, Zelda. Mm. Everything. Zelda. Zelda trumps all. Us. Us Spending. Trekkies have a <laughs> us Trekkies have a word for the, for that. It's called adapt. Also, also okay. Stephanie, well, I have a word for it. And it's called shut up, Leron. <laughs> also, Stephanie, the extra ten dollars for the the deluxe edition was not the stuff you get with it. Aside from three days early, it was not worth it. Mm, okay. So, unless oh. you like want to be a a bad guy. So basically, you paid to play for this one. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Uh, Laron, what are you? What are you? Uh, what are you playing? Go okay. Ahead, well, I am still. I am still. Uh, I am still continuing my 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 journey in the Ishimura with uh, Isaac Clark on Dead Space remake. I'm currently in chapter eight, so I'm two thirds of the way through the game now. Uh, still loving everything. Everything is done. Um. Uh, uh, nobody. 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 You guys, uh, Corey and Stephanie, you guys haven't actually played Dead Space. Uh, um. Uh. But Chase, uh, had have you ever played that game? I played um, the game, but I haven't beat it. I played okay. the game, but I haven't beat it. <laughs> I, I'm watching the Let's Play, so okay. So, so I just, I just got through. I just got through my second encounter with the uh, with the regenerating uh, uh, necromorph and stuff like that. And you know, like I was kind of, I was kind of hoping they wouldn't do the thing that they did with Mister X in the Resident Evil remake, which mm. they didn't do technically, but they did change up how and and how how when and why you encounter him now, and it and it's just like, oh my god, like we'll stop playing with my emotions and stuff like that so it's one of those things also uh also this is not a spoiler alert for uh, for any part of the game um but there, there's there's certain there's uh there's three times in the game where you get a, where you get attacked by that large tentacle is going to drag you into a freaking hole um so i got to a room that i remember from my first playthrough that yeah i'm like the tentacles coming and stuff like that you know so i was like creep walking you know down the hallway because i was like the tentacle coming and i need to get ready to start shooting um well I made it all the way down to the end of the hall, no tentacle. So I went ahead. Uh, I went ahead. I activated the door, and and then and then out the out because the because the game has like the one camera mode. Um. So so out of nowhere, as Isaac's walking through the door, the tentacle comes from behind him and grabs him. It was it completely freaked me out. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm. I'm still having fun. Like it's, it's, it's a nice trip down memory lane. Um, I am no longer worried about the one gun trophy because, like, man, like when I got the contact beam, uh, the contact beam is my favorite weapon across Dead Space One and Two. And seeing its new, it has a new primary fire mode. Um, and I was like, man, like it, I'm just using this gun the rest of the game. So yeah, I will. Uh, I will do my one gun trophy. Uh, when I when I beat the game and get the new game plus, because I'll also be doing impossible mode when I do new game plus. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that reminded me of a, a quick story. I remember when I was playtesting at Naughty Dog for Uncharted, and obviously I'm playtesting, and I got through a majority of the game with just taking other enemies' guns. And then so at my exit interview, they said it was like they asked me, "So what was something that annoyed you?" And I said, "Well, you know, it, it, the gun stuff didn't like rotate for the UI, so I just." punched the other enemies and got their guns and like well, wait that's a bug <laughs> <laughs> and it's like so you went through the game with just one like just taking enemies guns and going through them like yeah i thought it i thought that's how you would have to play the game <laughs> so, oh my gosh <laughs> that's awesome that's that's pretty cool so yeah i i, I commend the one gun tr- trophy <laughs> that's funny that's awesome that's so yeah. cool oh man so many cool stories you've told in like the last 20 minutes <laughs> 
And uh. and thanks to that darn Nintendo, like I'm actually playing another game right now. <laughs> <laughs> cuz uh cuz yeah like the Nintendo Direct threw me and um I was not number 1 like number 1 oh, actually I'm going to save it for when we talk about Nintendo Direct but I am playing Metroid Prime Remastered uh right now like as a matter of fact I was I was I was playing the, in the last 45 minutes before we actually had to get on to record the show and stuff like that so I neglected folding my laundry I neglected <laughs> you, <laughs> you know saw I had to scramble to get to get like something to drink <laughs> When we're getting to record and all that stuff, yeah, like I was, I was not prepared because uh, I you know was kind of, I was kind of overjoyed. You know, it's funny, Laron. I actually plugged my GameCube in about two weeks ago, and to pl- I, to play that game, I, play, I played a little bit of Metroid Prime. I played about forty five minutes of it. And I'm like, man, if they would just make this HD and put it on Switch with normal controls, you know what? And that's the thing too. Like, it actually has it actually got an HD treatment. I mean, it, I you can still tell you can still tell it's a uh, you can still you can still tell it's upscaled um, from the from the GameCube version, but it looks nice because you know you guys know me. I'm playing on a freaking 75 inch like 4K television and stuff like that. Yeah, and, you know, um, it looks nice. It looks better than I remember it. And um, and the control schemes, you know, because now you have like a, a you have a control scheme that actually that actually works for where is it? Where is it? You actually have a control scheme that actually works for this controller now because now you can you do dual stick, you know, game yeah. plan stuff like that. So you know it plays like a it plays like a first person shooter, and that was the one thing that annoyed me about the GameCube controller. The GameCube controller itself was not a bad controller, but it annoyed me that you had twin sticks on it, but they didn't let you do a twin stick like you know type mm-hmm. of gameplay yeah. on it, you know, stuff yeah. like that. Well, that yeah, too, so I, plus like, well, I mean, the twin stick stuff they were still trying to figure out twin stick controllers at that point too, right? Because remember, Resident Evil Four was also like that. Yeah. 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 So. Um, but but yeah, so um, I managed to I managed to get off that off the initial space station and stuff. So I'm actually I'm actually on Talon four now. It's so cool. Man. <laughs> I'm at 40 bucks, too. Not bad. They yeah, did not, not they didn't not Nintendo bad. bump it. Yeah, not they're, bad, because because there was like, a bit of a sh- I heard it was a bit of a shocker today on the, inter- uh, you know, on the interwebs about about certain other game. Oh, that Zelda was $70 now. <laughs> I was like, here it comes. Look, I pre-ordered that game like three years ago when it was announced on Amazon for fifty nine ninety nine. So it's mm-hmm. I just want someone to find the Toys R Us or Best Buy ad from 96 or to 99. About mm-hmm. N sixty four games. Mm-hmm. I just, I just want to see. I just want to see the way well, back. eighty dollar, eighty dollar games. I remember, yeah, games. You. <laughs> no, I remember. I remember staying. I remember working all summer, like just odds and end jobs because I couldn't get like a real job. Uh, because Tony Hawk's Pro Skater was a hundred dollars for Nintendo sixty four. Yeah. Ooh. Oh, how about how Wildstorm. about we go back? How about we go back a little bit further? I, I spent a hundred dollars for Chrono Trigger for the Super NES, and and that was brand new. That was brand new yeah. off the shelf in a store, and yeah, in a regular store. That wasn't. Mm-hmm. I didn't go to some like you know like like secondhand de- dealer. Yeah. <laughs> wow. And then remember, remember when Earthbound was in every Toys R Us garbage bin for like ten bucks? <laughs> yeah. I don't remember that, but I missed. I, uh. I have and, my now, and, pick up. and now it's a classic. It's a classic. It's crazy. Is it? Is it? Well, you, you <laughs> know it? what I mean. You know what I mean. You know what I mean. I, man, don't bring up Earthbound around me. I think it's one of the most overrated games of all time. But that's just me. Um, oh, I think it's, I think it's overrated too. But you know, like you talk to like you talk to like the Nintendo fans of that of that era, and you know, I know they swear by it. I know. Uh, but that's I was every- like, if you swear by it, then why didn't anybody buy it? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's it, that's what that's every Nintendo thing though right like everybody's looking for wii u's now i'm like okay well you should have bought i, I am not looking, i am not yeah. looking for wii u I got my, i'm, I'm not, not looking for wii u one. i'm not looking for one if, someone, if someone if someone if someone gives me one the, the only thing i ask them to do is give me a copy of monster hunter 3 ultimate while they while they give me a, a wii u that's all i ask yes I'll chase yes monster hunter and hyrule game. warriors and make sure you get breath of the wild on the wii u because it actually plays good on that mug <laughs> i have my breath of the wild for wii u is still sealed nice yeah all right, that's everything. That's everything I've been playing. So, uh, so Corey, you're up. I yeah. So, I've been playing a little bit of Shovel Knight Pocket Dungeon, um, mostly because I have become friendly with some people over at Yacht Club recently, and it's been really great uh, talking with them. Yep. Pocket Dungeon is the one that's more mini games than an actual yeah, adventure, like, right? It, yeah, it's like a it's like a puzzle. It's like a puzzle battler. 
is what it is. And you kind mm. of like go through and, and eliminate blocks to eliminate your uh, opponent. Um, I actually have something I need to write up for the website tomorrow. That's emb- <laughs> that's embargoed until 2 p.m. Uh, but actually, as we're, this doesn't release until Monday, so I guess I can talk about it. They're releasing a Valentine's Day event in the game <laughs> uh, on the 13th of February. And so I think that's what the release date said. I didn't read the whole email yet because I was prepping for the show. Um, so. Uh, so the the DLC is cool because like you can fill out a, a Yacht Club Google Doc and submit uh, an X an X's name and X. then they yeah like an X significant Woo. other. Woo. And that's that dirty. Oh, I can already tell where it's going. You can submit it and then they slap that name onto a, like a random boss enemy and then you can like fight your X <laughs> in this in this uh, DLC that's coming out. So. I've been, um, I have that information here. It's going to be up on the website. Go to bossrush.net if you want to read the whole story, see the trailer. Um, I will also be doing a Let's Play Games uh, episode for the, the YouTube channel if you want to check that out. Uh, but yeah, so I've been I've been honing my skills in Pocket Dungeon again to uh, <laughs> so I don't suck at the DLC when I go play it for this, for this <laughs> Let's Play. Uh, but I also have been playing Hogwarts Legacy. I played the first four hours of the game last night, and man, How oh my gosh! Oh, uh oh, uh oh! What house the, are you in? What house are you in? I so I'm gonna I'm gonna go through the whole process here. We'll get to my we'll get to the sorting hat because the sorting hat ceremony is awesome. By the way, if you have a Pottermore account or a Harry Potter fan account, you can link it to the game, nope. and it'll give you it'll put you in the house that you're in on the website. It'll give you your wand and it'll give you your Patronus charm. Nice. From Dang. so like if you signed up in like 2010 for that thing, it'll give you all that information into your game. Hey, Corey, yeah. I'm just going to let you know right now. My game is performing better than your game is in Metacritic. That's fine. Uh, Legacy, Legacy has an 86. Dead Space has an 89. That's fine. Woo! Uh, so I went through like the character creating process, which it's not that deep, like. I I really like Monster Hunter's character creator. I think Monster Hunter has one of the best character creators uh rise in world. It it's, makes me feel so 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 good to hear you say something like that. I mean, it does. I I know I don't play that I know I don't play those games, but I mean, I played like 10 hours of world and a few hours of rise, but those character creators are like there's there's no better character creator than Monster Hunter. Um Hogwarts Legacy definitely not that deep. You kind of take like a, they give you a list of probably like 25 portraits that you can pick from. And yeah. then you can kind of modify those portraits with like a facial structure and then hair, hair color. Uh, they, everything is kind of gender neutral. So like they kind of have, it's funny because with all of the backlash and protests against this game, they're kind of leaning into the opposite of what everybody is uh, protesting against. Right. So um, that's cool. And they don't use any gender specific pronouns in the game. Everybody or your student is they, their, them. Um, hmm. Oh my God. The turfs are going to be so mad. I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, so I was thinking about it this way. Like that's a cool thing to include in the game, but also like it also prevents them from like having to re-record lines. Yeah. For gender specific so it's like half the work and i mean whatever somebody can take that either way but i think i just thought that was a really cool kind of like nod to being inclusive and all that stuff actually i like that take because no in, in all honesty like you know like it it you know like it when we look at the whole battle about pronouns in the first place and everything uh, you know like a lot of people a lot of people you know like if you, you know like and i don't know why people don't think about this is like you know if 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 someone can't call you a him or a her and stuff like that a lot of people will naturally just default to to like just 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 call, just say they them when you talk about me and stuff like that people don't realize that 
we've been doing it, you know, since the beginning of time, you know, mm-hmm. stuff like that, you know, because like a lot of people would rather not offend by by misgendering you in the first place and stuff like that. So I don't know why I don't know why it's so stupid, you know, the yeah. way people think about this stuff and, and things like that. So you know, definitely kudos on kudos on the on the, on the dev team and stuff like that. I, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, you know, um. I've um I've 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 soapboxed this on crossroads quite a few times and stuff like that. Just because just because you have a problem with like someone that controls like the intellectual property or something like that, don't punish the people that are developing mm-hmm. the things that we like to do, which are video games. Don't punish them by, you know, by saying, Oh, you're not getting you're not getting an extended paycheck, you know, once this game is released and stuff like that. That's the dumbest thing to do because guess what? Eventually we will boycott and, and kill off all the studios to the point where there's no more video games coming out or everything's on mobile platforms and mm-hmm. we all know like mobile platforms aren't the ideal place for gamers like us. I know. Uh, uh, so the game, the game opens up, right? You c- create your character and then you, you are just kind of, as soon as, as soon as you create your character and you hit, okay, I, I didn't know how to model my character. Um, our, the character creator is up on our YouTube channel right now. Uh, if you want to check it out, I kind of went through it. Uh, and as soon as you like, I, I didn't know how to model my character. So I kind of, so I just like, you know what? I modeled the character after my wife and I was like, that looks great. Uh, the hair is a little lighter than I thought it was going to be. Uh, but whatever. Anyways, uh, as soon as you hit okay and name your character, um, you just kind of, it kind of just like zooms out and you're in the streets of London with, uh, one of your professors and someone that they're trying to figure out so, something's going on, right? That's, that's the premise of the game. You enter Hogwarts as a fifth year uh, transfer student. You don't really know why at first, uh, but you, you have to get to the sorting hat ceremony is kind of like the opening mission. And you're with Professor Fig, who is kind of your mentor in this game. Um, and so you're, the the whole opening is really just first of all the opening is dark i kind of forget sometimes how dark harry potter is but the opening of this game is dark there there are within the first half hour there are two deaths like horrific deaths Mm. and i don't want to i don't want to like spoil things but like and then you go to like it kind of opens similarly to the first harry Harry potter uh book slash movie where like you end up at Gringotts and you're going to a vault and um, then you kind of solve puzzles into into the vault. And after these puzzles and you get to where you need to go, you get to Hogwarts through this adventure to get to Hogwarts. You lose your wand, your magic stuff, your everything you need. Right. So um, you do the sorting hat ceremony, which is super cool. You go to classes, which is super cool. I did the first two classes for charms and defense against the dark arts. The combat is super intuitive. It's super fun. The movement in this game, sometimes you get into the third person action game and your movement's kind of clunky and slow and, you know, kind of tanky. And you're like, oh, OK, this, whatever, I'll deal with it for 20 or 30 hours, whatever. The movement in this game feels really good, like running and just walking up and down stairs, following people, talking to people, just it, the movement, the movement will make or break a game for me. And I got to say the, the just shooting your wand, doing the spells, uh, using the right trigger to pull up new spells is really cool. Uh, the classes are really fun and intuitive. The last thing I did <coughs> was uh, I went to Hogsmeade to get my supplies and you go through this kind of like I'm going to find the my wand or my wand's going to find me type thing and then you go and pick out your potions and your cauldron and and just all your supplies and then the last thing I did there's a a big battle in Hogsmeade and I don't want to spoil it because it kind of sets up the rest of probably what adventure you're going to go on but I this game I was smiling the whole time and I stayed up way later than I should have last night to because <laughs> I just kept playing and I just kept playing and I just kept playing. And I kept meeting new characters that were interesting. The assistant headmaster is a Weasley. Uh, oh my gosh. 
The yes. headmaster himself is played by Simon Pegg, which is hilarious. Oh, wow. He I plays, love Simon Pegg. He yeah, plays too. this like over the top, super like serious, but his delivery is like, it's so over the top serious that it's hilarious. And so you can't help but just laugh every time he speaks because he's trying to be serious and you know it's Simon Pegg and it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, Hogwarts <sighs> Legacy, man, it's... It sounds like the game that we've been wanting for since I remember when WB had it on this website, like 99 or something, whereas mm -hmm. and you could play that yeah. on the web browser or something. And this is sounds, this what you're describing sounds like the game that we've been wanting for freaking 20 yeah. something years. Yeah. And, and it, it sounds amazing. It is. Oh, it's 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 really it's really great. And like the opening missions are kind of they're kind of linear missions. And then it open, <clears throat> then it opens up into like an open world, and you'll be able to fly and stuff, go where you need to go. And there's a lot of collectibles and stuff. But <clears throat> oh, that's the other cool thing about the collectibles is like it rewards you for like oh, you found ten pages to your spell book. Here's a cosmetic reward. You can change like I got I got this really cool scarf. I got these magic gloves that like prevent like I have a defense buff because I have these cool gloves. Um, I have a new I have a instead of a worn out cloak, I have a new cloak that like my class, my house, uh, my house cloak, which I'm a Hufflepuff in case mm -hmm. anybody out there needs to know. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, that that was really cool. The the world is just it's big, but not too big. But it like there, when you're going to Hogsmeade, like you go with a classmate and like based on choices you make previously in the game and kind of how you decide to play depend like depending on those actions is who goes with you right and so you walk from the castle to hogsmeade and it like it seems like that should be like a really far walk and like it doesn't feel far and then the things that you can kind of explore and do slightly on the way there makes it feel like oh well this isn't just a waste of time to walk here and so i'm getting to the point where like the world is opening up and i can kind of go wherever i want and do side quests and stuff but man even walking through the castle and walking through the courtyard or going into the sorting hat ceremony or like you watching your student kind of sit up on the stool and kind of nervous like the animation of of her like crouching down as they put the sorting hat on because you're not sure it's a talking hat. Nobody's ever put a talking hat on my head before. And I don't know. This game is just, it's wonderful. Is it easy to get lost inside um, Hogwarts. Um, it actually is pretty intuitive. Every kind of class and section is kind of sectioned off into a tower okay. on its own. And uh, it's really good about navigating. There's the, magic compass that you get where like you, you kind of hold down i think you hold up on the d-pad and you kind of whip your wand out and it sends this golden trail of where your next quest is or nice. um so that's pretty cool um, oh man i'm i you're getting me more and more hyped for this i can't wait till friday like, but like it was cool because like i walked out of the castle i'm like oh my gosh that's where like that's where Harry started chasing the snitch and because, you know, uh or not the snitch, the the remember all when mm -hmm. Draco threw the remember remember all from uh Neville and you saw Harry chase it, I'm like, I recognize where I'm at. Oh my gosh, there's the Quidditch pitch over there. Um it's just no pun intended, this game is is it was magical experience the first four hours. <laughs> Now we just need PSVR 2, Hogwarts <laughs> Legacy 2. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, it's a wrap. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that's, that's what I've been playing. But this kind of actually leads into a small topic that I want to talk about before we get into the Nintendo Direct is like our perception, our perception of licensed games has really changed in the last, I would say, decade or decade plus, right? Like probably starting with something like Arkham Asylum. Um, I just I I have such high hopes for the certain games because you know, like licenses uh, licenses are like they're there to draw us in right like 
sometimes it doesn't pan out like the Avengers, but Guardians of the Galaxy was a wonderful experience, right? Arkham Asylum was a wonderful experience. Fall of Cybertron Transformers game was an awesome game. Like, I kind of really like when these studios are taking these licenses and taking them seriously. And like, I just, I want to know kind of what you think about where we're at with licensed games and how you feel about them. And, you know, are they, are they, do they still have that stigma of like, Oh, it's a licensed game. Stay away. Because like, aside from Avengers really, and I would argue that Avengers isn't really that bad. They just went the wrong direction with it. But like, what was even the last bad licensed game that you played? Dick Tracy. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, first well, of all, Chase, that's, been, pre- that's uh... pretty far back. <laughs> <laughs> I had to say it. I had to say it. I had to say I'm sorry. I had to say it. <laughs> it, it, it you know, you, you sound, you, I think you sound like what I was getting ready to say. Like, I kind of still avoid them like they're the plague for, mo- for, for the most parts because I've been burnt by a bunch of, by a bunch of bad, li- badly licensed games and stuff. Star Wars games being, being, being those, um, those are, those are some of the ones that really like stick out to me. Um, you know, um, so yeah, I kind of stay away from them because, you know, I don't know, like it, I'm one of those people where I don't, I don't want the, I don't want the games to be like the stuff that they come off of, but I do want them to be kind of faithful to that stuff. If that makes any sense, stuff like that. So I'm still, I'm still looking for like a good, a good adaptation. Now, Corey, what I will say though, like, you know, games like Hogwarts legacy, um, Marvel's Avengers, um, and, uh, and what was the other one you said? Guardians of the galaxy, Batman. Guardians of the galaxy. Okay. What I like about those games is like, they're using original they're using original ideas and storytelling you know that's not Mm -hmm. related to the canon Mm -hmm. and that's what makes those games stand out you know as as good licensed products and stuff like that because i think Mm -hmm. i think they i think most of the time they just go developers just go all in on trying to like I'm trying to like retell like stories from the stuff that we've already known and seen and, and they just get it wrong, you know, and stuff like that. And that's kind of why I have trust issues with that stuff. I bought Batman Begins for GameCube. It wasn't good. Oh. <laughs> it was pretty bad. Uh, it was on GameCube. You might try yeah. it. You might try the PS2 version the, or the Xbox version. No, the last yeah. good, the last good, uh, the last good licensed game that I remember playing before, like before we got to the day and age of well, before we got to the PS4 and X and Xbox One era, would probably be Batman Returns for the Sega CD. Oh no, <laughs> that would no, no, that one was good because they didn't they didn't mire you down in a bunch of the in a bunch of the actual um in a bunch of the actual like movie movie content stuff. It was a. Uh, it was pretty. It was pretty good. And plus, you know, like Sega CD, so they had like real music. So Batman Returns for the Sega CD, but Batman Forever was on Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo well, and Game Boy. Yeah. So well, yeah, went- uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of. It, it, it's it's crazy. Okay, that's 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 interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because I do, I do remember, I do remember like Sega CD, like you know, like like. We'd already we'd already gotten like uh, I think I think it was they basically like re-released Batman Returns on Sega CD, um, oh. and 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 they because like if you play the Sega CD version of that of that game versus the Sega Genesis version of that game, they're two different games. Mm-hmm. Were <laughs> they two, two different compl- developers? I think so. I think so. So that's that was what I was going to touch on in terms of like the where you, how we feel in terms of licensed games and. It depends on the developer and their their track record. Like Corey mentioned Transformers Fall of Cybertron. I think that was Platinum Games. Platinum Games usually does a majority of good licensed games, good development. Very rarely do they do they go under Rocksteady took the Batman franchise and made it what it is and nothing's I think it's gonna come close to that. They just gotta take <laughs> Superman now out of the out of the depths of the N sixty four and the PS2 game and make something out of that. Whoa now. man, that kryptonite fog was, was pretty <laughs> pretty awesome. <laughs> <laughs> And the multiplayer where you're all flying spaceships is also pretty cool. <laughs> say what you say what you will, say what you will. But I'm also thinking about from Russia with love on the on the PS2, how like really oh, smooth and fun like that is. Even playing about 20 minutes of the X-Men Origins Wolverine and how that how cool that is. And it's just 
I think it just really depends on what developer has it, how well they're doing it, and if they're and if they're going to do well. I even remember the Amazing Spider-Man where we're talking about how the story it related to the movie, but then it's got its own storyline that it's not you're not playing the movie and something i really appreciated about that and i think that was that was beanox who did that before insomniac took it and went wherever they went with it but actually those spider-man games ps1 those those games were fun i loved those games i think that was a claim claim, oh neversoft yeah it was neversoft yeah yeah neversoft another class very classic and well like highly acclaimed studio that of course like tony ox series mm-hmm. right yeah man uh yeah i just uh man you you get on this good run right like i mean even even injustice 2 something like that was super great but then you get something that like everybody hates like gotham knights just came out and i'm like <laughs> I, still, I still can't trust the the license game because out of every like three or four then there's always that one dud and you're like uh which uh, but mm-hmm. follow mm-hmm. the developer cory follow I the know. developer i know That's but you... here, here's the thing i liked i liked Mon- wb montreal's last game which was arkham origins i love arkham origins but like man i don't know i don't know but there's as you say that i still i don't want to give too much away but if you again follow the developer because it's gonna there's a tr- <laughs> there's a reason why gotham knights is that way but why you liked origins like, there's a little i don't want to give too much away but just just follow the developer and you'll see like oh that's why <laughs> yeah. yeah well yeah i know that they were working on a couple projects before what ended up being gotham knights but man yeah i know that that sure. team has been through development hell and back in a lot of different ways that you know so <laughs> Muriel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh right. man. This this is this is such a fun episode. I know, this is great. Uh all right. So now that we're done with that, man, Hogwarts Legacy. I can't Wait, like what was Stephanie's input for the license? I don't games? know. <laughs> she didn't she's just been kind of listening. I don't know. No, I have been listening. Also, you know <laughs> I'm trying so, to oh, yes. Try, save try, the energy. I am saving energy and, you know, there are times where I feel like I'm going to cough up a lung and that's usually when I'm really quiet. <laughs> so I haven't had a lot of experience with licensed games um, in, in the olden days, but I, I do feel like sometimes um, if certain devs aren't really careful with them or treat them with the respect they deserve and maybe just rely on the name and the license itself to make them um, their revenue, that's where you could tell where the quality suffers. I just happen to be mm-hmm. lucky where one of my first few licensed games that I've played um, was you know Guardians of the Galaxy, which was a fantastic game. And I believe Hogwarts Legacy is successful in part because they didn't choose to go on the actual Harry Potter timeline. They're doing it a completely different time and they're focusing on your experience just in that world. It's it's cool because Hogwarts Legacy, like it, like everything is modeled and developed from the movies. Like the castle is the castle from the movies, right? Hogsmeade is hogsmeade from the movie like i feel like even though they're not really like a you know quote unquote attaching it to the movies or like specifically the books and stuff like it feels like it fits with that without actually tying directly in and i've already seen a few fan theories floating around so if you're a harry potter fan just beware there are spoilers everywhere for this game um and it's not even out for everybody yet so just beware but they're already kind of making connections to certain characters from here to that timeline Time. it's just yeah. like, oh my gosh just yeah I don't avoiding know. that so anyway anyways yeah. yeah that's really it for me sorry well, I guess I guess we'll get to what Stephanie really wants to talk about. No, though, that's not true. The greatest Nintendo Direct of all time. <laughs> Stop mocking me. No, I thoroughly it was enjoyed a, myself. It was a great. It was a great direct. Um, like I said, was it? Was it? I look. I say the Ron, direct. Really? Is, here's here's the thing. I say if a direct has three or four things that I'm interested in, in it, it is a great direct. 
Oh, okay. You know what? If we, if we set, if we go by that bar, then this was a great direct for me. Mm -hmm. If yeah. we set that bar, because I, uh, I, I, I'll just, I'll just go ahead and say this, like, you know, like, you know, the, the classic bingo card, you know, it has five up and five down, you know, for you to get a bingo and stuff like that. Every line I had to put two free spaces in there, but I got a bingo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, for me, like, obviously we saw more tears of the kingdom, uh, the Metroid prime remaster. This, and this is for me personally, right? Like Metroid prime remaster, they kicked it off with Pikmin 4, which I'm a huge Pikmin fan. And then they announced a new Professor Layton game, which I'm all about. So I'm like, okay, this is this is great. And then obviously the Sea of Stars demo and the Game Boy stuff was like, well, sure, yeah, I'm Game Boy. Yeah, throw that on there. Original Tetris. Yeah. Kind of feel bad that I spent so much money on four different Tetris games for Switch now, but you know. It's fine. That's how they get you. They've been getting you since the yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly <laughs> how they get you. The, the worst part is the worst part is I bought Puyo Puyo Tetris one and Puyo Puyo Tetris two just to play Tetris. So I bought two games I don't care about in the same series just to play Tetris. Listen, loves you. we just need to get to the bottom of why Laron seems to be so salty because for him, he finally got his his Advance Wars, okay. He got <sighs> Metroid, which includes Metroid. Was it two and Met Samus Returns or something on this? Oh, I'm never. Game I'm Boy. never playing the Game Boy. I'm never playing the Game Boy and Metroid two again. Okay. Not when we have well, Samus Returns for the for the 3ds. All this Where's stuff, that Ron. HD remaster. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Advance Wars. You got your Advance Wars. You should be happy. Ugh. You know. Okay. You know. Maybe I'm. I'm, 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 I am being very cynical about it because, in my opinion, there was no real reason for him to delay the game. But I have my theories because remember when the game accidentally got – accidentally, you know, was accidentally released on the, on the eShop l l last fall? And um, and people were saying, oh, this game is playing terribly, you know. I'm not sure if it was just wasn't optimized because they weren't ready to let it out the gates or whatnot. But, you know, like people were saying that. So my real theory is like they 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 did what they did you know, and said, we're delaying it because of this, but what they really meant is that we're delaying it because it needs more polish and stuff like that. So, I am happy we finally got a date, and you know, like, it's right around the corner. Um, it doesn't... I got I got to look at April's release list, because I know March is a slam month. I need to see what April's looking like. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, that, that could be pretty terrible for... Or that could be a pretty terrible month for me as far as, like, my, my bank account goes. Um, <laughs> but, bank account. I mean, I mean, you know... And the, the thing is, I had my I had my my budget all planned out. I'm like, OK, I'm going to get I'm going to get Fire Emblem. And then February is going to be kind of busy because I want to get obviously I want to get Hogwarts Legacy, but also the Destiny 2 expansion comes out and I'm going to be all up in that at the end of February. And then I'm like, OK, well, March is kind of soft now, so I can kind of take March off or whatever. I know Star Wars is coming out, but like I'm like, I probably wait for that April. I'm like, maybe I'll pick up some games that I missed early on because they'll be on a sale in April by then. And then Zelda is going to take up like two months of my time. No, look, Nintendo had to drop Metroid Prime today. They had to drop. They dropped something else today, too. That was pretty big. Uh, oh, the Sea of Stars demo today. All in the same week as Hogwarts. Like, like come on, guys. I got to record three podcasts today. Yes. I got to I got to record two tomorrow. I got to play more Hogwarts Legacy. I'm probably going to skip Nintendo Power Block this weekend because I want to be ready for Book Club on next Friday, right? Like, sounds like you're taking a vacation. Yeah, I would like yeah. to, you know? And, <laughs> That's what man, it sounds like. I'm like, why do you got to do this to this week, man? You couldn't have just like push it a week so I could have like at least gotten like five or six hours of Hogwarts Legacy in. <laughs> uh, but to go back to what to go back to what Stephanie is basically like like grinding me about. Uh, basically, the problem I have with, the problem I have with a lot of these Nintendo directs is like they're they're not they're not always fun for me, you know. Because like you, you know like I, I I don't know like you know maybe maybe there's that old man is always screaming get off my lawn or whatnot. But I look at but I look at social media when these Nintendo directs happen and everybody is just like oh my god this oh my god that and I'm sitting like man these are games I'm not gonna play except for three games they mentioned today you know <laughs> you know i i kind of there's a part of me that kind of wants to be upswept in like you know like in like 
all the hype around you know Nintendo games, you know, like to to, to quote my mother, you know, from back in the day, they're Nintendo games, you know, but you know the same the same the thing is like I'm not Nintendo's audience, and that's and so like Nintendo's a hard sell for me. If I was if I was one of the people that Nintendo was banking on to be an investor, they they would have already been out of business. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man, I'm or they would or they would have had to change their business practices for for the, for the type of gamer that I am, you know, stuff like that. I'm actually shocked that the Metroid Prime remaster was announced today. Like, and they dropped it day on day and date. You know, it was I know. crazy. Ooh, <laughs> nice, nice, nice. Yeah, like I I was I was shocked that they actually announced it and dropped it today because like Nintendo already has the remaster scheduled for February that they drop every year. It's the dumb kirby game like sorry which by the way is this like the fourth game kirby game in a year that they released just about. in a year's time uh, in a year's yeah, time for- go ahead no you go ahead stephanie you know more about kirby than i do well they had the forgotten land some sort of buffet thing of a bob mm-hmm. then mm-hmm. this one am i missing the fourth one there was a that, you are that Ba- Kirby Battle Royale free to play game that they released oh, last summer. Free to play. And isn't there a, and isn't there a Kirby mobile mobile game that got that somebody slipped th- slipped through the cracks that's coming real soon too? I like don't know, yeah, the next Nintendo the next Nintendo like mobile thing is a Kirby game. Great. I bet it's like Flappy Bird. I bet that's all it is is Flappy Bird, but it's Kirby. <laughs> Flappy Kirby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's Dang. the worst. I hate that so much. So let uh, I guess let's do the rundown of this of this direct because we I mean you know like, rundown can we just oh, like, we don't talk do about a, we don't do a part. full rundown yeah because that's gonna take forever and well well let me ask you this Corey because because uh, I saw this trailer and I was like man Corey's gonna play this game Disney Illusion Island yeah I mean it looks like it looks like a 2D Mario game I, I'll probably play it although the Disney thing that got me more excited was the Disney Dreamlight Valley update with the Lion King. Mm. Yo, why are why are the why are all the characters sparkly? What is up with that? It's so the sparkling stuff is when you complete quests for them and you're bringing the magic back to the island as you destroy like you're bringing the dreamlight back to the island and mm-hmm. everyone ev- all the Disney characters like they all live on the island but they don't remember that they live on the island and they're stuck in their own different realms which is like the movies like there's like mm-hmm. you go to in the Toy Story realm, you go to I hate that I'm saying this because it makes me feel old. You're going to Bonnie's room and you have to like do quests for Buzz Lightyear and Woody. <laughs> right. And you have to like clean up Bonnie's room and find her like origami farm animals and stuff. And then like once you complete their tasks, you invite them to come back to the island. And the more characters you collect for your island, the less gooey, purple, spiky things. I forget what they call it. It's like the bad stuff that's taken over the island. But also, uh. you got to play this game where, like, you don't want too many characters on your island at once because when you harvest the purple spiky things, it gives you coins, which then you can turn around and spend to upgrade your inventory, uh, build your house, buy better farming uh, stuff, like, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, I don't mm-hmm. know. Disney Dreamlight Valley, though, amazing. The, the the spring the spring uh the February update comes on the sixteenth, and it's bringing Encanto to the island. It's bringing Olaf to the island. Um, so I'm very excited for that. Disney Dreamlight Valley is my Animal Crossing. So mm. okay. also okay, also I cool. signed up for the cloud save, so I can play it on my Switch in bed, or I can play it on my Xbox on my TV, and it's the same save, which is very nice. So. So yeah, so basically my bingo card got filled because of Metroid Prime. Um, that for sure. The Advance Wars one and two reboot camp. Thank you, Nintendo. Like finally, you know, like thank thank you because like every other direct before before now has been just <laughs> depressing for me. Yeah. Um, uh, the um, what was the uh, what was the other one? There there there's th- there's three of them specifically, and then the bonus of Game Boy Advance. Like this is what I wanted. This is what I wanted for now. I'm, I'm kind of I'm kind of peeved that is behind like the expansion pack, you know, the expansion pack thing, you know. Yeah. But whatever, you know, because like I'm 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 in a friend's family plan and stuff like that. So you know, um, what is the other game that it's I'm funny because that missing? Game Boy stuff actually leaked two days ago and nobody believed it. Oh, did it? What the Game Boy or the Game Boy Advance both of them, stuff? Both of them leaked like, oh. two days ago. See, 
See, I see. I knew that the Game Boy, I knew the Game Boy original Game Boy stuff was coming. I I, I knew yeah. that, you know, just just because, well, just because, you know, I just track like how the fans react to all this stuff, you know. So it was one of those things, you know. Um, well, it seems like it, it seems like the handhelds are like the last venture into the Switch expansion pass thing, right? Because it seems like they're really doing the remaster thing for GameCube stuff, and mm-hmm. and after, right? Because uh, they're probably going to remaster DS well, and 3DS stuff. This this, this Metroid remake tells me that their remaster tells me that Twilight Princess or Wind Waker are coming next year at the mm. beginning. Oh, and they oh, also oh, and direct, oh, Nintendo gets on my nerves too this, because like if I had known if I had known the Mario and Luigi was coming to the to to Switch, I would have never bought the 3DS one. Oh my gosh, dude. <laughs> well, the 3DS one is way better. It, it, yeah, it's got a lot yeah. of quality of life stuff to it. But like this direct really screamed to me, hey buy all the uh, play and buy all these cool old games and Zelda and Pikmin because you know a we're either going to have this huge blowout in the summer or b we're working on a new console and we are really just trying to churn content out until we can put something out like with the new console I I still think I still think this... Metroid Prime 4 is going to be a crossover game kind of like Breath of the Wild was and I still think Mario Odyssey 2 got pushed to the whatever is next. And it's going to launch with both of those. Now, I'm going to go ahead and say this. And I guess this is where, like, you know, like everybody's going to, like, just just be all up in my mentions in my DMs. Um, thanks to the trailer for, for Tears of the Kingdom, I can I am definitely I am definitely on the train that Nintendo needs to, like, get new hardware out mm-hmm. because Tears of the Kingdom does not look like a good game. You know, it, it's visually striking and stuff like that, but it doesn't look it doesn't look next well current gen honestly you know well i mean it, it looks like a it looks like a wii u switch game which is exactly what i expected uh also like not to be a downer <sighs> about zelda specifically we're some, just breaking stephanie's heart today i everybody knows i love breath of the wild it's my it's my favorite game of all time i spent 250 hours in that game I found all the Korok seeds. I did all the things. There is something off about this Zelda game that I cannot pinpoint. And I saw like three other people say the same thing on Twitter today. People that are big Zelda fans. And and I don't know what it is, but I can't pinpoint it. But there is just something about this trailer, this trailer in particular. You know, Mm -hmm. I want to touch on that just briefly. So when breath of the wild got announced the very first time i wasn't excited for this game at all i wasn't remotely and there's only two games i think in the entire zelda series that I was thinking eh, the same for me and ironically those end up being most, one of my most favorite zelda games which is wind waker mm-hmm. and then breath of the wild something about how they do these trailers or how they present the game isn't where the the pull is the pull is getting your hands on. Mm-hmm. And so I would I would be I would be cautious to say don't look into the trailer. Mm-hmm. Play just play it because mm-hmm. I remember thinking when I got it on Wii U, I said to myself in my mind when I opened it up, I said if this game if I can't turn on this game and turn it off and come back into it, I'm not playing this game. And <laughs> whatever, whatever I thought that literally, and I went in and it opened and I said, okay, I'm, I'm in the little open sanctuary. And then I was like, okay, I'm saving them out. And then I went back in and was like, <laughs> well, I'll be damned. I guess this is the end. <laughs> and it was totally yeah. the end, but yeah, yeah, something about how they do those trailers is not enticing. No, so I would- yeah. I a hundred percent agree, Chase, because I was expecting more of a story trailer, and I think even Dan from Boss Rush kind of like, oh, this isn't getting me excited. I honestly think, um, and I know I've kind of made myself look like a overly hyped person, but I just genuinely do think Nintendo's holding back on purpose because mm-hmm. we still don't know what the hell is going on. We don't. Yeah, we like literally... whose voice was that that opened the trailer? By the way, I did not like that voice. I'm like, is this supposed to be Ganondorf? Because it sounds like a terrible Ganondorf. Just it sounds, sounds like a terrible, like, <laughs> mid-2000s anime game. Yeah. So I'll be honest with you. See, I can say something I don't like. I really did not like that voice. But at the end of that, I'm like, okay, this was gameplay trailer. But we still don't know the true mechanism. We don't know, like, we, we don't know the mechanism. Is that a dark world? 
time travel. I think underground, underground, whatever. I think they're holding it close to the chest because it, it must be a very story heavy game versus where Breath of the Wild was more exploratory and less story driven. So that's why I'm not necessarily getting down on it yet, though I would agree like this is the trailer that we've been waiting for because we've been waiting for information. We're waiting right. for the hook of the game because the hook of Breath of the Wild was first open world Zelda. And they did, I think, a treehouse where they kind of showed a sampling of how it's open world. And that was the hook. We're missing the hook for Tears of the Kingdom. The reason why I am willing to have faith in is because The Legend of Zelda next to Mario, Mario's the number one franchise, is so beloved to Nintendo. I don't think that they're willing to afford a flop for it. Mm -hmm. I just don't think they're willing to do that. Especially yeah. like, especially that stretch after Wind Waker, right? With <laughs> Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword, and like, as I love, I love Twilight Princess. I'll defend that game until the day I die. I, but I know the Zelda community does not like that game. Uh, well, Nintendo, I would like to give, I would like you to give me a fair shot at playing Tw- Twilight Princess because I never played it. So you release know, on three I consoles. Have a Switch. You've had your time, okay? Three consoles. What? 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 It's been released on three consoles. <laughs> you've you've had enough time, okay? GameCube, we Wii U. Okay. 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 <laughs> Although it would be nice to have it on Switch. Um, as somebody who's purchased that game four times. <laughs> well, Nintendo has a track record of re-releasing games, so you, I, you wish. Well, I like the well, you see that's the cool thing. You see, I love the Switch for the simple reason is portability. Mm-hmm. You know, even though I play it more in dock mode, like it's the portability. Because like when I go on vacation and stuff, the Wii is uh, the Switch is always coming with me. <laughs> You know, technically, you, know, technically you can play handheld mode on the Wii U too, Laron. On that nice 480p I know, I know. screen. I, I, I know. I loved it. That my child lost time. My child's tablet has a better screen on it than that Wii U tablet. Oh, I hate that tablet. Gosh, man. The Wii right, U. So, so, anyways, um. So, what, everybody, what so everybody, what what Zelda. got what got you guys like really excited? You know, um, like um. Because, Hold on, I'm going because back. I'm, I'm going back to Zelda real quick before we before we talk about what we're really excited for. Because like, okay, okay, I I think the hook, going back to Stephanie's point, is Breath of the Wild had this hook of being the first open world Zelda and super exploratory and whatever. I think Nintendo is banking on this the hook being that this is a direct sequel to Breath of the Wild, and that they've shown things that are intriguing that fans have no idea what's happening, and that's the hook and you know i mean i'm gonna buying it day one you know what guys you can shut up about your 70 dollars. guess what they gave you metroid prime for 40 okay there's your t- 10 extra dollars you can pretend. well i mean I, I i mean they i mean i would have i would have been a little outraged they they brought they rolled it out at 60 bucks I'm honestly i would have I am shocked it wasn't 60 bucks, but at the same time, if they rolled it out at 60 bucks, I'd have been like, really, when there was a Metroid Prime trilogy, you know, at one point that gave you all three games? Yeah. <laughs> and, and a $60 package? Well, that just tells me that all three of these games are coming this year. Yeah. And they're going to space them out one a quarter, probably, or I guess one every third, or whatever. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm satisfied because I'll buy them. I actually, I actually think they're going to release two and three at the same time. As a, you think? I think they're going to release them for forty dollars a piece, or you can buy them as a bundle for seventy. Well, actually, that makes sense because three was a direct sequel to two. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't the events of three take place like Im- almost immediately after yeah. two. Yeah, yeah, From what I can remember. Yeah, um, <laughs> and then they'll pay you to take uh, other M. Uh, <laughs> I'll. You know what? I, I I will I will fall on this sword. I will get other M if they put it on Switch yeah. as well. I so, will I will I will fall on that sword. All right, Laurent, we can go to I'm your I'm telling point. you, I'm, I'm, I'm a Metroid fan. I'm, I told you. I know. Gosh, Metroid Dread's so good. By the way, I, po- I popped that in the other day for like 20 minutes because it feels so good to play, but I suck at it. It's still I, really good. Yeah, I told I told my boyfriend he can he can officially hold on to my, uh, my, my, my physical copy that he's borrowed for like the last year. <laughs> um, all right, so Laurent, we'll we'll hit your point and then we'll, we'll kind of wrap it up because we are yeah. kind of running a little long, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, so... What was your point? What really got us excited? Is that yeah, what really what, what really got you guys excited? It, it wasn't it wasn't the Zelda thing, pray, pray tell, right? It wasn't that. I mean, was it? Zelda, I think Zelda's a given. I think everybody's uh-huh. excited for Zelda, even though this trailer wasn't Honest, exactly the most excited, exciting thing. What what did get what I did get a charge out of is we actually got a release date. We we got, got a we got a bonafide release date for for Tears of the Kingdom. We got it last like, time. We got it last time. 
We did? Yes. We did? May 12th. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, oh no, I, it didn't, was just I didn't know that. Gameplay trailer. So shows uh-huh. gameplay. And then mm-hmm. uh, announcement of collector's edition and the Amiibo. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, shows how much I paid. So, so how much I pay attention. Uh, we know so, you're not the uh, Nintendo guy in this podcast. <laughs> well, well, you know, unlike yeah, you, Leron, I was excited about this direct not just because of Zelda for me, but all the other games that I might not be interested in. But I'm really happy for everyone else. Oh, don't cop out like that! Come on, look how don't look, cop out. Like look at that. all these DLCs of games that I'll never play, but I'm excited for everyone else. Splatoon, my son like flipped out when he saw that there's going to be DLC, so he's excited for that. For all those JRPG no. people, Fire Emblem and Xenoblade Three got DLC. The Octopath Traveler Two, Sea of Stars, stuff like that. That's More stuff. Mario Kart Eight stuff. Big whoop. Yeah, big whoop. My son loves Mario Kart, and he was excited I love about Mario too. Kart. You can, I can um, go wake up my son, and you can poo poo uh, on all those things that he loves. No, oh, I don't God. need another crying child. Today. Yeah. <laughs> Chase, what were you excited for? I didn't see it. I'm just going to be transparent. Whoa. I was, re- I was recording music for the game I'm scoring, so I was. Playing school. Hey, you, hey, you, had you had priorities. You had priorities. <laughs> I forgot. I feel I have it on my watch later. It's up on my screen right now. So oh, I'll sorry. Be, we I'll just totally update, but... ruined it for you. <laughs> yeah, we did. It's fine. Well, no, like, I mean, I've got to have my own experience in my own space and free time. I, it was, I, I, I well, go ahead. Uh, no, no, no. I, just, I got excited real fast because I just realized the fourth thing was like the Dead Cells Castlevania expansion stuff. Like, th- there it goes. There, there's my four things from this whole thing. So yeah, just from hearing the three of you talk about it, I love Castlevania. I love Game Boy stuff. So I'm knowing that some things are going to happen there. I I saw the trailer for the Tears of the Kingdom, so that's what I was able to talk about. I definitely concur with about that whole Ganon voice. I actually wanted to stop it and watch the direct in Japanese to see if there was going to be a different voice or something. It like, <laughs> can't be the right voice. Or I got to have something else. So there's there's things to look forward to. And I'm sure as I watch it, there's going to probably be some little parts in there where I'm excited for those things after the fact. But yeah, I didn't, I didn't watch it. I was working. That's a good <laughs> idea, Chase. I think I'm going to look up the Japanese trailer because I really want to get that terrible sound out of my brain. <laughs> there were uh so there were three gamecube remasters in this four technically i guess um yeah with metroid prime tales of symphonia which we knew was coming oh, yeah. but also baton baton kato's games mm-hmm. that bundle uh mm-hmm. which i told i told shane i would play them even though they're card games uh i actually owned them for- oh they are card games yeah. well they're they're card based battle rpgs uh okay but like i owned them for gamecube uh and i i don't remember them at all but anything that monolith touches the xenoblade developers i will i will touch back so there's something um that monolith. played uh called the etrian odyssey or something i've yeah, never played odyssey, yeah i've never played those games before but it seems like such a really cool and unique well, not unique, but um, cool idea of like kind of ma- drawing your own map as you explore, and it's like first person. Mm-hmm. That's something yeah, that I was... caught my eye. Sorry. Oh no, I was gonna say it was cool because like it, because they were DS and 3DS games, like you could use the stylus to draw your map, and it was really cool. Mm. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I thought you were stopping. Um, oh, that was all I wanted yeah. to add. Uh, for There's... me, I mean, actually. What? Sorry. Oh, is it? There's something for everyone. That's all I was saying. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for me, seeing that Pikmin got a, a release date and some gameplay, Pikmin 1 is like a top <laughs> 10 game for me of all time. I love Pikmin 1. Uh, and the fact that they're going back to like one space person and you can kind of go through and get the different Pikmin and obviously the introduction of Ice Pikmin and like the weird bizarro <laughs> enemies at night looks weird like it it's like what who put who put dying light in my pikmin uh but you know it's i'm excited to play pikmin i you know three was three was good but it was kind of disappointing and kind of a little overwhelming because the the joy of pikmin one is that it was the, its simplicity in you know you have one captain olimar you can have up to 99 pikmin and they all have different abilities and unique ways to level up. And, you know, you find the parts of your spaceship and you leave like that's 
the joy of in simplicity. And two was like a little bit more complicated, but still kind of, you know, not overwhelming. And then when you get to three, like you got to, there's six different types of Pikmin now. And then you got three, uh, space spacemen and you got to like separate all your Pikmin between the three spacemen and you got to do the separate. And it's just like, Oh my gosh, this is, this is too complicated. Although I will say one of like three games that is worth using the Wii remote nunchuck on because it was the only way that you could run dodge and throw your Pikmin at the same time because you could do the throwing motion with the remote and run with the, the joystick. And then you could have the game pad on your lap as a map. So <laughs> Pikmin three pro tip that you switch deluxe owners will never know. Anyways, that's it. I dig it. I think we did it. I think, I think that's going to be a wrap. Uh, Chase. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. It was really a pleasure having you on. You are welcome back anytime you want to come back and talk games or music or talk about projects you're working on. Anytime you want to come back, you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I really appreciate that. It was awesome getting to know you. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to be on and chat with you all and have a really fun conversation. It's been a long time since I've done something like this. So it's been really cool and getting to know the three of you as well. Uh, you want to you wanna tell people where they can find you and find your work uh, before we get out of here? Sure. Yeah. So you can find me. I'm mostly active on Twitter nowadays at Chase Bethea. That's B-E-T-H-E-A Bethea. And you can, if you listen to any music that you're interested in, I'm chasebethea.bandcamp.com. Got On the Peril Parrot soundtrack on pre-order it's a bossa nova style and so i'm taking it and moving it in a different way still dynamic music and that game is in steam next fest right now so you can check out the demo and play it with the music that's actually in there and i love spotify follows i love title listens i love youtube i love all of that stuff so please please check that work out if you love video game music that i typically do awesome yeah and we're gonna we're gonna throw all those links in the in the show notes so people can have easy access to all that um so it's there will also be in the 1v1 interview that's coming up as well so you guys should listen to that it's also going to be right here on the boss Wars podcast feed uh on the friday that it comes out and uh yeah you can follow us at boss rush podcast at boss rush media and at boss rush network on twitter I want to thank everybody for watching and or listening. Laron and Stephanie, thank you for your time tonight as well, as always. Uh, and until next week, we love you. Goodbye. Bye. Take care. The Boss Rush Podcast is a product of Boss Rush Media, LLC, and is recorded from our headquarters in Akron, Ohio. This show is produced, written, and directed by me, Corey Deering. My co-hosts are Stephanie Klimov, Laron Dawkins, and Edward Barnell. You can find Stephanie at Klimov underscore author on Twitter and Instagram, as well as on the EXP cast. You can find Laron at Exodus803 on Twitter, Instagram, Twitch, and YouTube, and also on Crossroads, the video game podcast. You can find Edward at that retro code on Twitter and Instagram, as well as hosting Nintendo Podblock. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at I am Corey and HD. You can find me hosting Tower Casuals, the Destiny Podcast, and co-hosting Nintendo Podblock. Find the Boss Rush Podcast on all social media platforms at Boss Rush Podcast. You can also follow Boss Rush Media and the Boss Rush Network on all major social media platforms. Join the Boss Rush Network Discord and Facebook groups to interact with other friends and fans. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.